Before I introduce His Highness, if I could ask if you just move in toward the center. There are a few seats remaining. We'd like to get as many students in as we can today. Could you, if you have an empty seat next to you, could you raise your hand? Maybe we don't. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to welcome His Highness Tui Atua Tupa Tamasi Efi. He was elected in 2007 as the head of state of Samoa. He has held a number of academic positions during and after his political career as an MP and Prime Minister for two terms. He has authored three books and numerous scholarly journals and publications from his government and academic pursuits. His Highness serves as an associate member at Wakaito University and as an adjunct professor in New Zealand as well. He is former resident scholar for the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and at the Australian National University in Canberra, where he served as a doctoral examiner for Pacific and Samoan history. At Samoa's archaeological site, Pumele Mound, to, uh, His Excellency helped begin excavations, and at his direction in 2003, Samoa held a ceremony to honor Thor Heyerdahl for his contributions to Polynesia and to the mound excavations. Described by many as a defender and proponent of, of the Samoan language, His Highness was educated at St. Patrick's College and at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. We are extremely pleased to welcome His Highness to campus. Please join me in welcoming His Highness Tuya Tua Tupa Tamasi Efi to BYU. Vice President, Director, and Vice Director of the Kennedy Center. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday at the University of Utah, I spoke about Chufing Oletua Oi, negotiating boundaries. Today, I wish to share some thoughts on navigating the future. In reading my itinerary, I noticed that within the audience today may be students of political science and international relations. To attempt to offer an intellectual treatise so soon after such a beautiful and filling lunch seems too taxing and ask to impose on you. <laughs> Therefore, I will only offer some brief food for thought on the metaphor of navigation which has some resonance with the theme of leadership and leading. I am one of the patrons of a Pacific initiative called the Emerging Pacific Leaders Dialogue, which involves giving young Pacific leaders opportunity to meet and talk with current and past leaders of different Pacific countries, including Samoa. The main question for dialogue is how to navigate the future. This question is posed to these young leaders as more than a question about how to assess checklist menus. It is meant to force them to think deeply about why we should navigate in the manner chosen, how such navigation techniques can balance competing interests, when a strategy might work and when it might not, and so on and so forth. These are standard political science questions. For me, the bigger and more challenging question has always been how are leading, do we, how are leading, do we balance what is right, just, and loving with what is Samoan or Pacific? Pacific indigenous navigation is a powerful metaphor for Pacific leadership. It has relevance to the current global context. As a Samoan, I probe my own culture as reference for it offers a Tulanga Vai or firm foundation for my reflections. Samoan navigation culture. In Samoa, there is a group called the Ainga Folau Samoa, Samoa Seamen Guild Association. I am also patron of this group. 
The purpose, function, and vision of Ainga for Laos is to restore our culture of navigation, not for its own sake, but in the main to help identify the cultural, moral, and spiritual underpinnings of traditional navigation culture and locate its relevance in the current context. We need as a nation to rediscover the great feats of our forebears, particularly when we seem to be overwhelmed by globalization and alien heroes. We need to celebrate the heroic and epic achievements of our own forebears as a reference for our own development moving into the future. The fears, the feats of early Pacific navigation were imbued with a psychology of affinity and survival, where the ocean, its fauna and flora, the birds, stars, clouds, moon, and so on, were believed sacred. The spirit of adventure and responsibility that surrounded Pacific navigation placed mana in the water, in trees, in clouds, in birds, and all that the navigators would use to travel the seas. The quest to go out on long voyage, voyages was a holy mission in that the navigators bonded and held sacred conversations with nature and the gods. Samoan historian Toysu Shu Dr. Damon Salesa, who teaches here in the United States, found that it took the peoples of Europe until 1336 to discover the Canary Islands, which was only a few hundred miles off the African coast. But by this time, Pacific Islanders had found every inhabitable island in the Pacific Ocean, most of which were comparatively small and spread over waters that spanned more than one quarter of the globe. For some time, people were stand in awe and wonder at the accomplishments. It is something that continues to puzzle and inspire. Scholars and navigators marvel at our traditional Polynesian star charts, our reading of the waves, assessments of bird flight, wave reflections, and or refractions, and they marvel at the accuracy of that knowledge in determining direction and distance. Within this navigation culture, there is a love of the environment, of the birds, the trees, land, stars, heaven, and of course the ocean. And there is a loving and sacred conversation between these natural elements, the gods and navigator. In Samoan navigation culture, when assessing the tide, you are talking to the tide, hence the word daudai. When assessing the moon, you are talking with the moon, hence the word daumasina. When engaging in these assessments, you become in time in tune with the environment in a way that ultimately reflects a loving conversation with God. This conversation between man and nature, man and his gods, bespeaks harmony and affinity between them. Man did not have unfettered dominion over nature, the sea, stars, birds, plants, land, and heavens were family. In the Samoan indigenous religion, all matter, human, water, animal, plant, and biosphere are issues of Tangaloalani. They are divine creations connected by genealogy. They share the same biological beginnings. In similar order to biblical creation, the Big Bang feces, the Samoan indigenous reference asserts that while man might be the most evolved and intelligent of all, Tangaloa Langi's creations, he is nevertheless the younger brother. As such, his relationship to all earlier creations must be one of respect. The respect of Alualo that must be shown by man to all things is a respect for the sacred essence, the sacred origins of their beginnings. This is the cornerstone of Samoan relationships with the environment. When man wants to know how the seasons affect nature, he need only look at the interaction between animal life and the cosmos. In the Samoan context, the palolo coral worm rises in October and November. That is determined by the last quarter of the moon. 
The months of the year are determined by the appearances of the moon. The Samoan word Taumasina literally means time according to the appearances of the moon. The importance of stars to ancient Samoan creation mythology and to Samoan fishing or navigation techniques is recorded by missionary records as playing a significant role. Diligent security of the heavens every night for guidance about planting, sailing, and fishing was performed for practical survival. Reading stars was performed in such a way that respect both for their service to man and for their genealogical links was obvious. The use and reverence given to Tapuite, the morning and evening star, is an example in point. The soa or companion of Tapuite was, as recorded by Reverend Stair, believed by ancient Samoans to be an awkward that the chief is about to die. When Samoans point out, literally the sun has fallen, or literally the moon has died from hemorrhaging, both speak honorifically to the death of a chief. In each of these cosmic occurrences, the indigenous Samoan culture finds that despite man's superior intelligence as earthly species, the mysteries of the cosmic and physical world are beyond them. This reminds man of his place in creation and the need to respect his kin. When natural disasters affect our region, we have to ask ourselves what has happened to this respect. The challenges of navigating 21st century global politics are not that different to the challenges of navigating our oceans. In both cases, we need a sturdy boat, an anchor, sailing skills, and knowledge of the environment. We need to know when and where to anchor and when to set sail and when not to. We also need positive faith in ourselves, respect for our environment and enduring hope in survival. In Samoan navigation culture, there is a common saying, meaning there is a time to reflect and a time for action, a time to wait and assess the elements and a time to set sail. Pacific leaders must have a sense of pride in themselves and their cultural histories in order to be able to survive the turbulences of their modern environment. This means that you must be able to find yourself in your cultural histories and indigenous references before tackling the references of others. Once you have this, you will have an anchor that will help ground you as you search for meaning and place within the broader context of regional and global politics. Navigating global politics. To understand current Pacific politics, Pacific leaders must make themselves aware of underlying forces. Pacific politics do not exist within a vacuum. No island is now outside the reach of the globalization machinery. Therefore, it is wise for Pacific leaders to inform themselves of the competing swirls of global, regional, national, cultural, and economic politics. <coughs> In 2009, eminent Catholic theologian Professor Hans Kung launched his manifesto for a global economic ethic. The manifesto is an attempt by leading economists, businessmen, and ethicists to take responsibility for finding ways forward out of the quagmire of doom and gloom of Pinochet tragedies and into something positive and potentially empowering, something considered essential if we are to save the planet and ourselves. Kung's manifesto re-emphasizes the importance of ethical values and principles. Article 4 of the manifesto cites, manifesto cites the biblical rule what you do not wish done to yourself, do not do unto others. This is referred to in a manifesto as the golden rule of reciprocity, which it states has for thousands of years been acknowledged in all religions and humanist traditions, and promotes mutual responsibility, solidarity, fairness, tolerance, and respect for all persons involved. In Samoa, these principles can be found in our action, in our notions of alofa, 
Fellow law, if a tosia, if a osia, it to farm a mouth out on a lot of four mil dolu and four talafemai. Words that refer to the imperatives of love, respect, selflessness, mutual responsibility, solidarity, reciprocity, wisdom, justice, and fairness. These indigenous words help to locate and nuance these globalized principles so that they have meaning within our own Samoan or Pacific context. The complexities of what Klein is talking about and the profundity of the solution that Kung is recommending does not undermine or invalidate the legitimacy of the wisdom of our Pacific forebears. In fact, if anything, it makes the wisdom even more powerful and compelling. The greatest threat to human life today has to do with the problems that climatic changes impose on us. We who live the near the sea or close to fault lines have and will continue to feel the devastating effects of these changes unless something concrete is done about it. I wish to reiterate today that the work of your church in developing environmentally friendly solutions to the negative impacts of energy consumption on our environment must be commended. I implore more churches to do the same. As indigenous peoples, we have an offer on offer a wisdom based on our indigenous references that are worthy of being probed for its relevance to the problem of climatic changes in formulating our contribution. However, we must not lose ourselves in the brilliance of grand theorizing. As Pacific leaders, we must remain clear on what our core questions are, what our reference points are, and what our measures for assessments are. We would not be remiss to remind ourselves that the brilliance of the Chicago School of Economics has today been found severely wanting. What the world, which includes ourselves, should be looking for are theories that have brilliance in their simplicity and decency. Conclusion. To conclude, I wish to say that the leadership of Pacific peoples requires having pride and vision, the courage of conviction, and a belief in ourselves, in our Pacific heritages, and in the need to protect that heritage. In trying to revive the navigational culture of our Samoan forebears, Ainga Fulau Samoa is attempting to practice this leadership. After unraveling, the conspiracies of neoliberal politics, Naomi Klein ends her tour de force with a reminder that what ultimately helps us move out of a crisis is ourselves, our human will, or what Kung might call ethical will to survive and to claim what is right, just, and true. It is, as some might say, to be masters of our faiths and captains of our souls. My final words I give to the Monsignor Ioanni Vito, who I will always remember for his never-ending commitment to the belief that the wisdom of our Samoan forebears had just as much truth and relevance to our lives today as the wisdom of Christianity. And just as modern knowledges can learn from our traditional knowledges, so too, he believed, can our religious knowledges learn from each other. During one of our musing sessions on Samoan indigenous religion and Christianity, Monsignor Vito looked at me and said boldly, always remember to poor one, God is a God of history before he is a God of theology. To Christ's language is simple, free. The conversation between God and Samoans predate Christianity. His point was that the wisdom we need to navigate the future as Pacific leaders is right under our noses. We just need the time. We just need to take the time to look. So it will.
we'd be interested to have you line up here at this microphone, and uh, we will uh, proceed in that order. Please remember to say your name and what you're studying before you ask your question. Do you have any questions? <coughs> My name is Scott Gowdy, I'm studying international relations. My question is, um, in your lecture you talked about how it's important for us to rediscover <coughs> uh, the peace of our own forebear. My question is, is what is one of the great peace of the Samoan people? I, I did I, I must excuse myself, please repeat your question. I, I've got rather uh, defective here. My question is, is you, you said it's important to rediscover our own feats. Or, or the feats of our forebears. So my question is, is, what is one of the great feats of the Samoan people? Yeah. Well, uh, I speak for more than people. I speak for the Polynesian race. And um, we claim that, you know, we, we populated the Pacific Islands uh, and less time then the Europeans took, you know, to get to the Canary Islands and to get to Latin or North America and to South America. And it generally can recognize as high achievement. And uh, what we're trying to do here is not only to revive the, the culture of navigation in order to connect with our forebears, their values, but as well, the attendant knowledges, such as you know, connecting with the stars, talking to nature, talking to God, being able to read the seas. Uh, I mean, today, uh, you, you need to get onto the iPod or to the radio TV station to find the wireless. Before, in, in my forebears, uh, the, the older generations, they read what was going to happen through the stars, who, you know, when the time the trees bear things, there was that very close uh, linkage. And this, we believe, is something that, amongst uh, the many things that we've accomplished, we have lost uh, to our loss, and it has to be revived. We believe that the answer to the climate question is to revive that conversation. Uh, that we have to be able to talk to the trees the way our forebears talked. We have to be able to communicate with the stars and receive our, not only the messages about the physical environment, but also the spiritual metaphors and nuances in order to find ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, that's a very interesting... Uh, <laughs> American Samoa. American Samoa. Oh, yes, he's, he's trying to correct me. But I, I don't see it in terms of American Samoa and Samoa. I see it in terms of Samoa. <laughs> but uh, uh, I remember uh, your Secretary of State uh, referring to the, the disproportion uh, of representation by... Uh, American Samoans, or even Samoans, uh, generally, because I mean, we, we, there are two ways whereby we get into the United States, uh, either through, uh, through uh, going through panel or going through the Mormon church, but <laughs> <laughs> accessing. <laughs> and, uh, and this is how we, 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 we uh, get into uh, gridiron. Uh, and our presence is, and the question is, how do we get there? Well, I'm not sure. 
we, we have got our, our rugby series going on at the moment, and one of the strongest teams is the All Blacks, the New Zealand team. There are eight Samoans in the New Zealand team. They have more reason to be playing for us than to be playing for New Zealand. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the disproportion is worse in New Zealand than here. But the, the question as to why this happens, uh, maybe, I say to myself, maybe if we, if we revive or restored the conversation with nature, the disproportion would be larger than it is. <laughs> Hi, my name is Noah Driggs. I'm studying international relations. Um, one of the big issues in the news is the upcoming vote in the UN on um, Palestinian statehood. I was wondering, um, what was Samoa's stance on Palestine? Um, and if there have been any countries trying to influence Samoa's um, <coughs> on Palestine issues? I'm not sure what the uh, Samoan government's uh, uh, position. Uh, and I, on Tikli's political issues, um, I, I remind myself I'm a head of state. And, uh, <laughs> and I remind myself of the goals common. The goal, uh, <clears throat> the goal is not to the left, the goal is not to the right, the goal is about. <laughs> Meaning that, you know, heads of state are supposed to steer clear of politics. But um, I, I can tell you I have uh, many, many uh, friends on both sides. Uh, it's been my privilege to, to be involved in interfaith uh, uh, colloquiums. So I talk to, uh, to uh, both uh, Arab Muslims and to uh, uh, Hebrews. And uh, <coughs> I, I think um, uh, the solution to the problem will have to come from them. Um, and um, it, it's... It's a, it's a very difficult issue uh, and governments, and I've been head of government and I've had dealings with these people and, uh, over the years. It's, uh, it's very problematic um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's a question not only of faith, but it's a question of history, a question of soul, a question of finding yourself. And um, it, that being so, it's very difficult to be judgmental in these issues. It's very difficult to say this is right and wrong uh, because if you probe the history, if the report probe the reference point, you will realize uh, that it's it's going to take some time, you know, for them to sort out some sort of accommodation. The problem is here that you have uh, politics, world politics. And then you have not only the politics of power politics, but also the politics of military power politics intruding in the equation. And uh, for that reason, it's uh, very complicated. The best I can say is that I have, I have friends on both sides who come and stay with me uh, because I, uh, I'm interested. I'm generally interested. I, I tell people that it's true. I, uh, I went to university and crashed. And my wife breathed through, so I married my wife in order to get a free education. <laughs> but uh, uh, even now, you know, I'm trying, I'm forever trying to get a free education wherever I can. And I exploit my friends dreadfully. <laughs> Not only my Muslim friends, but also my Hebrew friends. And I've learned a lot uh, about it. And I tread very carefully, not because, you know, I'm frightened to put my neck out. It's simply that it's a very, very complex issue. And I love both, both of my friends, the Hebrews 
And uh, Arab Muslims, I go to interfaith people and I meet them a lot of times. I not only love them, I pray for them. like to say that, you know, and, uh, but take one thing, uh, language. Um, the language is the very core, it's the heart and soul of a people. Uh, our language is threatened, very threatened, and we fear for its future. So notwithstanding the closeness that uh, appears on the surface, and the fact that I think a lot of it has to do with bonding. Um, for instance, now I uh, I uh, I'm moved by the responses of our people who come here because core to our culture is re reciprocity. I've hardly contributed to these people's lives, and yet they would put themselves out, whatever they can afford, you know, to put on something on my behalf. And, and there is, you know, a powerful statement about bonding. There is that. But I think that it would be a mistake for me to overlook the <coughs> big challenge that we've got. Uh, we, need to, we need to do things about it in order to ensure the survival of our language. We need to get into the academic conversation. Uh, meaning we need to take our values, our heritage, our, our theology, our philosophy into the, the academic conversation because that's a way that we can, we can influence curriculum and we can influence the education of our people. If we lose that battle, then uh, the very essence of what keeps us together and the bonding would be lost. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, 
um, uh, I learned something from uh, the program that we were exposed to the other day. You have a film on family uh, that you uh, take your guests to and have a look at, and it's a beautiful film. And I recommend to anybody who's not been to that uh, uh, center, uh, because um, I think that today you can't, you can't underestimate the threat to families. Uh, that, you know, it is, uh, it is what sustains civilization. Once that is lost, then it's very difficult to sell all the other things that we value. They all seem, in my view, you know, to derive from family, a strong sense of family. And I think that uh, one of the reasons why Mormons have a high conversion rate, and it's worrying to mainstream religions in Samoa, is because of the, the family orientation of your message. I, uh, people, it resonates with our people. Uh, because leaving aside the labels, the theology or whatever it is, this, the family, the idea of family, and um, selling that, you know, not only to your own immediate family, but selling that message, you know, to all that you're connected to is, uh, is fundamental, not only to our theology, our philosophy, but our worldview. And um, so uh, I'm with you. You're talking to the converted. And more of the family orientation, the more uh, of the message with family is uh, something that you know, would certainly warm the hearts of any Samoan leader or any Samoan parents. Uh, my name is Connor Well, uh, you know, I, I quoted uh, Fulton Wilder, uh, and there is that line uh, that, you know, it's the only bridge and the only meaning that survives is love. And if it is loving, people can tell that you see God. Uh, you see, God, you, you go up to the humanitarian efforts, and this is what I said to the people there when I, after talking to them and seeing what they're doing, I see God's face, not only in your face, but what you do and what you say. And if, you, if you're wanting to, to do, uh, if you're wanting to, to help people, then that is the beginning and the end of it all. Um, yeah. My name is Michael Boyles, I'm an economics major, and um, I lived in New Zealand for two years as a missionary, and I got to see so many impact of um, people moving from the islands of Samoa into New Zealand, mostly searching for jobs and moving closer to family. And I was just wondering, what are some of the things that you observe as far as how the economics of the islands are affecting the economics of the world? C come again. What, so is, what, is, what is the effect that you've seen that the Polynesian islands have had on the world as far as economics are concerned? Well, um, uh, we're, we're trying to cope like anybody else. Uh, in terms of uh, an economic message uh, to the world, it, it would be um, presumptuous uh, of us. Uh, given our situation um, uh, and the, the reference. I mean, in order to, to, um, in order to articulate an economic management, you need lots of philosophy, a lot, lots of research, and a lot of, I mean, it's a very, very complex uh, uh, science, if one can call it that. Um, 
but we can only talk about you know our own problems. Uh, I mean, the, the fact is that what happens, particularly in the United States now, impacts on the whole world in a very real sense. Uh, and um, we're getting to be very much like a global village. And it's very difficult to separate, you know, the face of the United States, you know, from the face of the Pacific Islands. Uh, and also, it's uh, the impact on the lives of people who are not well off. Um, we're, we're getting people to probe this and they're coming out with statistics which are worrying. We're trying the best that we can uh, to cope. We're still, um, we're still emigrating in very large numbers. And in fact, if we were, the truth is it, if we were allowed to we'd emigrate some more, uh, and this, uh, this is a worrying economic factor uh, because the real reason why people want to emigrate is because of economics. Um, so that we have much to be grateful for. On the other hand, you know, people say we've had lots of people analyzing the Pacific, you know, and how they're faring. And the general consensus is that we're, we're doing well. Uh, but we can't sit on those laurels. There are, we have some very real problems at the moment, and they're going to get worse before they get better. Um, so, given our situation, um, it's it's very difficult, you know, for us to say, you know, this is we we can only we can only address uh, the ethics of a position and say, well, you know, this is wrong ethically. And I think that uh, in the end, uh, you cannot say that America is America with its power and whatever. You know, we're in the same planet and we've got a great climatic uh, problem. Huh? The ozone layer and all the threats, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to work together and for us, I think that we, we need to revisit the wisdom of our forebears about climate and the conversation with nature. And we can bring that into the conversation with the United States and other people uh, about uh, uh, how, we can, how we can cooperate in handling this. I was quite impressed by uh, what uh, Elder Banks was saying yesterday to me that the Navajo helped your intelligence to break uh, code, you know, the, the, the code of certain. Now that's, that's an amazing, an amazing thing. Uh, so he has promised to give me a book uh, on it. But what, what is highlighted here is that you can't, you can't condescend now, or you can't say that, you know, because I'm so powerful, therefore I need not listen. I think one of the great things that we have to learn is to listen to each other, you know, however small and insignificant they may seem. Changes, yes. Um, well, let, let me. Lots of uh, uh, we're all we're all changing. You know, we're people, uh, and when we're beginning to recognize, you know, that you know we're we're talking to people, uh, and we're human beings. In the ultimate, we are human beings. We have basically the same problem, and I make this point by referring to your memorial services. I cannot imagine 
that a Muslim mother or a Muslim father can watch and listen to that and be unmoved. Because in the end of the day, we, we are all people. But how to, the, the big question for all of us is, as human beings, uh, how, because I mean, if this, this is not resolved, it will spill over and affect everybody else. But what is happening, and which I find very inspirational, is for somebody like Elder Bank saying to me, we helped the Muslim to build a mosque. That's a powerful statement, because what you need here is dialogue, is understanding. And that's the beginning of a dialogue. You have, uh, you have him saying that he's studying Muslim. And he's got, he, he invited one of the top Muslim scholars to talk. And he's reading it. And he, he said, well, I'll give you the book. And he gave it to me. And I promised that I would read it. Now, that I believe is a solution. If we generally are looking for understanding of each other, if we talk to each other and listen, both sides listen, we'll find that we have much in common. And we'll find the solution to this problem is very simple. The solution is remorse and forgiveness. And you will not find remorse and forgiveness without understanding and without dialogue. God bless you.